Experiments are the best of the quantitative designs to use to establish probable cause and effect. Crest Wall, page 295. Experiment form of research began in the late 19th century and early 20th century, and in 1903, Shiler introduced the use of control groups. And for much of the next 50 years, most experimental research was done in this idea of control groups and random assignment within these groups. It was not until the 60s where Campbell and Stanley identified the major types of experimental design, 15 in, 15 in total, that are still quite popular today. These experimental designs were aimed to eliminate potential threats to validity. And this idea of validity is actually really, really important when we think about experimental design. And I'll get back to this a little bit more here in just a minute. So what is an experiment or why would you ever choose to conduct an experiment? Well, all experiments start with an idea. The idea comes first, and oftentimes we refer to these ideas as treatments or interventions, and you want to find out if your treatment or your intervention will have an influence on some sort of outcome. This is sort of basic cause and effect, if you will. Crestwall states that you use an experiment when you want to establish probable cause and effect between your independent and dependent variables. Or in layman's terms, wait for it, or in Raymond's terms, huh? Does the treatment have an impact on the outcome? Now, we did find a study that kind of illustrated this really, really nicely. Ming Sheng wanted to study um, a group of graphic design students that were tasked to create a logo for a local company. What they did was is they split the group into, the students into two groups. One group of students got some traditional workshops that were sort of lecture based. The other group of students got some workshops that were problem based learning where they looked at some real life examples and then they were tasked to create a logo, a logo for a local company. And basically what they found is that students that were in the problem based learning treatment had a higher degree of creativity and flexibility. So. When we think about these experimental designs, I think one of the things that is the most important or most critical piece that you want to think about is we're dealing with humans, right? We're dealing with students and there could be a thousand things that may influence some sort of outcome. It's not like we're doing an experiment in a lab and growing something in a petri dish where we can control for all of these variables. And so this is where your experimental design is actually very, very important you are attempting to control all the variables that may possibly influence the outcome except for the independent variable. The ultimate goal in experimental research is to be able to say that your idea, your treatment, your intervention caused or probably caused some sort of outcome. And because of this, um, Cresswell in indicates some really key characteristics for experiments and I want to list a few for you. The first is random assignment. This sounds simple but there's actually some complexity to this. Second is the control over variables. Once again, we want to eliminate as many influences so we can say that our idea had some sort of um, impact on the outcome. The next is, is we want to make, we want to manipulate treatment conditions. In experiments, right, the researcher is actually doing some sort of intervention to see if that impacts the outcome. The final, or um, we, we're always going to be looking at group comparisons, right? We want to see whether or not one group got it compared to another group. And once again, the most important thing when we're thinking about uh, elements of or characteristics of experiment is that we want to eliminate as many threats to validity as possible. Now, in experimental design, there's a couple of forms that it takes on. We can look at between group experimental designs or we can look at within group experimental designs. And I don't want to bore you with the details of each step within um, elemental design. But I think one thing that's really important is you got to decide whether or not an experiment is the right course of study for you um, or the right form of research for your problem. Once you've identified that, a re that an experiment would be the right, um, the right way to address your research problem, the next step or basically from there, all you're doing is you're trying to set up an experiment in a way to eliminate as much, as many threats to your validity as possible. Finally, at as with any research, there are some ethical considerations and experimentation is no exception. Uh, the Cresswell text listed a couple of ethical considerations, but one to me stood out more than the rest of them. And this is the idea of withholding treatment when individuals and in control groups may be disadvantaged by not receiving beneficial treatment. The example that just like came straight to my mind was uh, cancer drug research. If you know your cancer drug or you have a good sense that your cancer drug may have some positive impacts on patients, it would be unethical to bring in groups, split them into control groups, and give one group the drug and one group not the drug when the when the group that didn't receive the drug could greatly benefit from receiving the drug. And so um, this idea of withholding treatment is unethical when there is some negative uh, when there's some negative impacts on the group that may not actually receive that treatment. 
What do you do if you're unable to control for some variables? Or let's say you wanted to see the relationship among multiple variables. Then correlation designs might be the best choice for you. Cresswell defines correlational research design as a way for investigators to use correlation statistics test to describe and measure the degree of association between two or more sets of variables. For example, student motivation and maybe their success on a particular assessment or assignment. Another important concept is this idea of covariance. The idea is that variables are connected in a way that if we have knowledge about one variable, we can use that knowledge to predict another variable. This idea was used in a study by H. Jansen and his team at the University of, of Alberta. This study um, used correlation statistics or this idea of covariance to predict the scores of students on the Stanford Bennett Intelligence Scale, the SBIV, based on their scores on the Weschler Intelligence Scale for children, the, S, the WISCR. And so essentially, if we knew this knowledge about one exam, could we use this knowledge on students' scores on one exam to predict the knowledge on the other exam? And of course, in this study, they did find out that there was a strong correlation between their scores on the WISCR and their scores on the SBIV assessment. Now, there are a couple of key distinctions between experimental design and correlation design. One, correlational designs are focused on associations or correlations of two or more variables, often variables that are difficult to control for, like student motivation. The other um, key element that's a big difference between correlational design and, and experimental design is that researchers do not attempt to control or manipulate variables in the study. Whereas in research, researchers often go in and they apply some sort of treatment to see the results in a uh, correlational study, they are not actually influencing or manipulating the experiment in any way, shape, or form. Now, correlation studies have been around for well over 100 years. Actually, the correlational formula, formula that we use today was presented by Carl Peterson in 1895. And during this time period, best practices were also established around sample size, per precise measurement, and the use of unbiased samples. It wouldn't be until the introduction of computers in the 70s or 80s that we see a big advancement to the use of correlational studies. As you can imagine, and as we all know right now taking stats, stats are hard to do by hand. And so the advancement of computers has allowed researchers to study much more complicated associations amongst many more variables. Now, in correlational designs, there are two major types of correlational designs. There is explanatory design and a prediction design. Explanatory is really just saying, hey, how does one variable impact another variable? Whereas in a prediction design, we are predicting the outcome of a certain variable based on knowledge that we have. In either design, there are a couple of key characteristics to correlational studies. The first is that they always include some sort of association between scores or tests or any sort of um, thing that they have measured. The second is that they all they tend to display their scores in, the, in a scatter plot and in matrices so that way you can see how the correlation happens, whether it's strong, positive, whatever it may be, all those fancy statistic words that we're losing. And finally, they use multiple correlation and regressional variable analysis in their analysis of their data collection. When dealing with correlational studies, there are multiple ethical considerations to take and account for. Since the idea is to establish correlation, Cresswell emphasized the importance the important considerations that you need to take when collecting data, considering sample size, including as many predictors as possible, using the appropriate statistics, and of course, certainly not, not last but not least, don't make up any data. Hey everyone, let's talk about surveys. Surveys have been around for a while. In 1817, this fellow here, we'll call him Mark, developed an international survey of educational systems, and in the late 1800s, G. Stanley Hall began to survey children. The Pittsburgh survey, developed around 1907, looked at a number of educational issues ranging from school planning to student issues. From World War I to World War II, survey design improved greatly with better sampling techniques and scales of measurement. Many surveys today are funded by national and state governments. However, just about anyone can administer a survey. It may show up in your email as a Google form or from SurveyMonkey. It can also be just as easy to complete a survey. You might do it to skip past an advertisement on a YouTube video, or possibly to win a free prize from your local grocer. There are two main types of surveys, the cross-sectional and the longitudinal. While a cross-sectional survey will collect data at one point in time, a longitudinal survey will study changes over a period of time. A cross-sectional survey is beneficial for studying current attitudes, beliefs, opinions, and practices, 
much like the Falk study that measured the perceptions of Texan school superintendents regarding online teacher education. Longitudinal studies are good for collecting information regarding trends of the same population, cohort or subpopulation changes, or possibly changes experienced by a panel of the same people. These are respectively broken into trend studies, cohort studies, and panel studies, and each can be useful to the educational researcher. The Sun article, The Impact of Student Teaching Experience on Pre-Service Teachers' Readiness for Technology Integration, is an example of a longitudinal study as the pre-service teachers were routinely surveyed over the course of their student teaching. The main thing to know about both cross-sectional and longitudinal studies is that they both examine data for a sample of the population and retrieve their data through the form of interviews or questionnaires. That being said, Researchers always hope for a high response rate to help ensure that the data collected is an accurate representation of the population being surveyed. Educational researchers use questionnaires and interviews to research a number of areas. If they want to find out public opinion regarding college tuition or evaluate a new school program or to examine how a group of middle schoolers transitioned into high school. Before getting started with a survey, it's important to keep in mind that questionnaires are a type of survey that the participant completes and may be sent to the participant through mail or online. Interviews may be conducted via telephone, a face-to-face one-on-one, or with a focus group. It's important to have well-crafted questionnaires and interviews as they can yield useful data for researchers to examine. When developing questionnaires and interviews, one wants to take special consideration. Since we're talking about quantitative surveys, a questionnaire can be fairly straightforward as the participant will answer the questions, some demographic information about themselves, complete it, and give it back. Interviews, on the other hand, since we're talking quantitative here, need to be well-structured with mostly close-ended questions. Do you understand what I'm saying? One will need to go through the process of coding participant responses and analyzing them closely to determine what category of a response they may fall into. You also want to make sure that you use clear language. You don't want confusing or misleading questions, as well as answer options that may overlap, are confusing, or aren't necessarily applicable to the participants being surveyed. Lastly, you want to make sure to run a pilot test of your questions. This gives the researcher the opportunity to make any necessary changes based on the feedback they receive. As mentioned before, the questionnaire will take care of itself as the participant fills it out. However, when it comes to conducting an interview, you need to keep several things in mind. First off, you want to be an interviewer that remains neutral without bias throughout the interview. The interviewer should not share opinions or guide the participant's responses in any way. If you need to train interviewers for your research, it will be important to make sure they are familiar with the interview questions and how to handle possible interruptions or questions posed by the individual being interviewed. Essentially, you want to develop guidelines for the interviewer to remove as much bias as possible, train the interviewer, and also follow the interview steps and guidelines that have been laid out. Some of the ethical considerations to keep in mind involve collecting data, analyzing results, and reporting results. When collecting data, both interviewers and interviewees need to be kept safe and not put in any harm's way. Also, researchers must make sure that incentives to complete the questionnaire or interview are appropriate and that they follow through with what they offer. When analyzing and reporting the results, it is important that confidentiality is maintained and that the researcher destroys the survey instrument after they have met the minimum retention required usually about three years. A lot of times, survey research is made exempt by an Institutional Review Board, or IRB, but still must be submitted to the Review Board in case the survey covers sensitive topics or populations. So you think you want to conduct a survey for your research? Well, if that's the case, then make sure you follow these steps laid out by Cresswell. Make sure that a survey is right for you and your research. Identify your research questions or hypothesis. See if you can identify two variables that might relate to each other, such as years teaching and beers enjoyed on a Friday night. Identify the individuals you are going to survey. You want to make sure you are surveying the right population. Surveying zookeepers on pedagogical approaches may seem like a natural fit after a long day, but it won't produce productive results. Determine your survey design and how you plan to collect data. Are you going to develop a questionnaire or interview? What's going to work best for you? Create or utilize an existing instrument for your survey. No need to recreate the wheel. There's a lot of quality instruments out there for educational research. Before getting started, make sure to check out what's been done before, and then give the survey. Afterwards, analyze your data and answer your research questions. Finally, write it all up. Well, that's all I've got for you on surveys. So, you want to take a survey? Would you like to take a survey? You want to take a survey? 
Did you like this video? Would you like to see a new movie? The results are in. You did. You know you did. Thanks for watching.